you have a Bible, I invite you to turn to Psalm 18. I cannot uh, overemphasize how blessed we are to have a church that prays for one another. What a blessing that is that you pray for me, I pray for you, all of you every day, and, and that is definitely a, 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 a testament to how much we love and care for one another, even despite our differences, our different personalities, but we still are called to love one another by God's uh, grace. And so I pray as well as you pray. And that's a blessing. It's always a great thing to have that in God's church. And so before we look into Psalm 18, let's come before the Lord and ask his blessing. Father, we pray in Jesus' name that you would speak to us through your Holy Spirit. That you would anoint my lips. So the words that come forward would be your words to us for your glory. Your glory well. We thank you, Father. Pray this in Jesus' name. Well, hopefully you enjoyed your extra hour of sleep. Uh, sometimes that actually works counterintuitively because some of you probably stay up an extra hour. If you like me, I see people in my family, they go, oh, I get an extra hour of sleep, so I'm going to stay up another hour because, hey, free, uh, free hour of sleep. So whatever, however you used it, um, it's great to that you, those of you, it looks like you set your clocks correctly. Otherwise, you'd be here an hour early. Uh, last week in Psalm 17, uh, we learned how we appeal to God. To hear our prayers because of Jesus' righteousness and our love for Jesus Christ. And today in Psalm 18, we're going to look at how our love and our adoration for God comes from our response to God's love and his deliverance. That everything we do as a believer in Jesus Christ, everything we do as God's people is not out of duty. That we shouldn't be doing things because we feel obligated to. Or we shouldn't be doing it or, or, or obeying God's word because uh, he's, he, we feel threatened by him. But rather, our love and our adoration for God comes from a response of love to God's love. And to his deliverance. We respond to his love and deliverance. Now in the book of Psalms, if you look in Psalm 18... You'll see there's quite a lengthy, what we call a superscription, even before verse 1. The, that little title, that subtitle there after verse 18, or chapter 18 of Psalm 18. Okay, before verse 1, you'll see it in, in all caps. It says, To the choir master, a psalm of David, the servant of the Lord, who addressed the words of the psalm. To the Lord, on the day when the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies, and from the hand of Saul. And so, just to remind you that that part of the superscription of each psalm, whenever there is a little heading there, that is part of scripture. And that is in the actual original Hebrew texts of the Old Testament. And so we do look at them as well. And the superscription basically is telling us that David wrote this psalm after decades of fighting, uh, battling his enemies, and all through all the decades of fighting was over, David had a time of rest. Okay? This is when the day when the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. And so David's basically reflecting back over the years of conflict to praise God for his victories over those who wanted him dead. David also will prophetically speak of the victory won through his own descendant in the future, Jesus Christ. So he's going to talk about his own deliverance, but prophetically he's also going to speak of the victory won by Jesus Christ. So let's go right into it. Verse 1. I love you, O Lord, O Yahweh, my strength. That's how he begins the psalm. I love you, O Yahweh, my strength. So this psalm, again, is a loving response that David has toward God. It's the, David's loving response to the God who rescued him. Now, that may seem kind of obvious. Of course, David's going to love God. But the question for us this morning is, do we love God as David does? Do we start our day, I love you, O Lord, with all my strength? Okay, Many people don't actually love God, if I'm really honest. Including myself. I, I sometimes have the question, do I really love God like David does? Many people don't actually love God even when he rescues them from danger. 
I mean, Jesus rescued his disciples. Remember when they were in the storm and they were on the boat and they were about to drown and Jesus was sleeping on the boat? Okay. And they thought they might drown. And so, so they, they, they woke Jesus up and Jesus calmed the storm with just the word. He rescued them among many other times. But in that time, they rescued him from, from what they thought would be a storm that would drown them. But who was on that boat? All the disciples, including Judas, the very one who did not love Jesus because he betrayed him for 30 pieces of silver. See how ungrateful some of us can be? We are rescued by God. God delivers us. Judas was rescued. And yet he did not truly love Jesus, as we see. And he betrayed him. You know, many people today have their prayers answered by God at times. But they still do not love him as David does. I mean, sure, we may be grateful when God answers our prayer. Of course, I'm not saying you're not grateful. We may even thank God. We say, thank you, Jesus. But you know what? As life goes on afterwards, the months and years pass, we still do not truly love him as David does. I love you, O Lord, my strength. See, people pray for healing. And God may answer us, but still we do not love him. People pray for their loved one's safety when they go on a trip or maybe they even go off to the military to war and God brings them back safely. And still, over time, people still do not love him. People pray to ask God to help them financially in finding a job. And God may provide for them unexpectedly. But in all these things, we do not say, as David does, I love you, O Yahweh, my strength. See, if we truly are God's people, we will not only receive his blessings, but we will also genuinely love him. And when we believe Jesus Christ died for our sins and has given us the gift of eternal life, just knowing these facts often isn't enough. Because what matters is that we have faith in him and that we truly love him in response to his blessing. Do we truly love God for all that he has done for us? Matthew chapter 23, verse 27. And Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. Is that you? Do you love the Lord your God with all of your heart? And all of your soul and all of your mind, I, I confess, sometimes I don't. Okay? I don't really love him with all of my heart, all of my soul, all of my mind as I should. 1 John chapter 4, verse 20. John says, if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. Do you love everyone? Okay, as your brother and sister in Christ, do you truly love them? No, I probably don't. Okay, then you're a liar. You don't love God. Okay, we can claim we love God, but it doesn't, it doesn't mean it's so. John chapter 14, verse 15, Jesus says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth. So Jesus then says, you know, if you love me, okay, you must love me with all my, your heart, soul, mind, and strength. He also says, if you love God, you must love your brother. Okay, you must love your brothers and sisters. Because if you don't love your brothers and sisters, don't say you love God. And then he says, if you love me, you will keep your, my commandments in John 14. Okay, and that's what the love of God really is. That's what he calls us to. And I know that I don't love God as he calls me to. And often I render, you know, when I ask myself, why? Why is it that I don't love God as David does? Why don't I love him as much? And the answer is often it's because I'm not grateful enough. I'm just not grateful enough. I know the blessings he has given me. I am grateful for salvation, but I'm not grateful enough to love him enough with all my heart and soul and mind and strength. I don't, love, I'm not, I don't love him so much that I love all my brothers and sisters, okay, as Jesus calls me to. I don't keep his commandments. And when I fall, feel short of these things, I know it's because I'm just not grateful enough. And maybe you understand that. Maybe you can experience that in your own life. But as Jesus says in John 14, 
If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And then he says greatly afterwards, see what he says? And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, capital H. And who is that helper? Even the Spirit of truth. The Holy Spirit enables us to do the things that God calls us to do. Well, none of us are going to be perfect on our own. In fact, if you try to live the perfect life as God calls us to, and love him with all your heart, soul, mind, your strength, on your own strength, you will fail. The only way you can do it, as he says, is he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth. John 14. It's through the Holy Spirit, surrendering to the spirit, not my will, God, your will be done. Maybe I don't feel like loving the person that you call me to love, but you know what? I surrender to you. I surrender to your spirit. And then whenever I am able to do what he calls me to do, and I am able to love people, it's not because of me. It's because of the spirit of God within me. Right? So I get no credit for loving people. I get no credit for obeying his commandments. I get no credit for loving the Lord my God with all my heart, soul, and strength whenever I'm able to do so. Because it's only the spirit that enables us to do that. And so that's what's important. It's the reason why, another reason why I don't love God as he should is because I'm not surrendering to the Spirit. I'm not saying, God, not my will, your will be done. You help me. I surrender to your will. And so I'm not grateful enough. I'm not surrendering to the Spirit enough, and that's why I don't love as David does. And David then, then tells us who God is to him. Who is God to him? First of all, he says, I love you, O Lord, my strength. And then verse 2, he says, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. What you see in those two verses of verses 1 and 2 is the word my a lot. You see the word my? Okay. Included with each name that he gives God, he'd say, you're my strength, you're my rock, you're my fortress, you're my deliverer, right? You're my God. David is expressing a personal relationship with God. You're my God. You're my rock. You're my deliverer. You're my refuge. And so he's saying that he knows God personally. He knows God as his own. The list focuses on God's protection and his salvation. You're my rock. You're my fortress. You're my deliverer. You're the one in whom I take refuge, my shield. And so he's focusing on God's protection and his salvation. And David is praising the greatness of God he loves. And he says in verse 3, I call upon Yahweh, who is worthy to be praised, and I am saved from my enemies. And so he's praising God because he says he is worthy. I call upon Yahweh, who is worthy. He's worthy to be praised. David next tells us how God saved him. David's life was in danger many times throughout his life. I mean, when he was a shepherd for his family, he, had, he had said that he, taught, he fought a lion and a bear. Remember, he says, I, I killed a lion and a bear with no weapon, just a club. Okay, I grabbed the lion and bear by its beard and I, just, I clubbed it to death. Can you imagine being, being able to do that? God protected him while shepherding his father's flocks. David was also known to fight the good giant, Goliath, right? With only a... Uh, 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 sling and, a, and some stones. Okay? King Saul tried to take David's life several times. And even his own son Absalom later in his life tried to kill David in battle. Tried to take over his kingdom. David was constantly in danger throughout his life. And yet he says in verse 4, the cords of death encompassed me. The torrents of destruction assailed me. The cords of Sheol, that means the grave. The cords of Sheol entangled me. The snares of death confronted me. See, David was close to death many times in his life. And David's later descendant, Jesus Christ, would also face death, as we know, for our sake. I mean, Jesus, after dying on that cross, and he was put in a tomb, he did not remain in that tomb. As you know, he rose from the grave three days later. And what does that mean for us who believe in him? It means nothing else but that God will also save you from the cords of death. The cords of the grave or Sheol entangled me. The snares of death confronted me. And, and God delivers Jesus from the cords of death. 
and he also delivers us through Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 14, Paul says, He who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and brings us with you into his presence. See, that's what we have. So this psalm, when he says he delivered us from the cords of death, you know, the cords of death encompassed me, the torrents of destruction assailed me. He's talking about the death, not only of David, but also of his descendant Jesus, who rose from the grave, and also talks about how the cords of death confront us. All of us will die one day. And yet he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also, the scripture says, with Jesus, and bring us with you into his presence. What a glorious salvation we have in Christ. Our love for God is a response, therefore. Our love for God is a response to the many ways that he has helped and delivered us, beginning with our salvation from death. That's the first and foremost thing that we can be thankful for, to God. And so if we are truly grateful to the extent that we are grateful for what he has done, beginning with salvation and all the things that come afterwards, all the things he blesses us with, it's our response to him that causes us to love him. Our love for God is a response to the many ways he has helped and delivered us. Beginning with our salvation from death. You will die someday, but you will also live. What a great and glorious destiny we have. And so our love for God is a response to his love for us in rescuing us from death. Now, how did God save David? Verse 6. In my distress, I called upon Yahweh. To my God, I crawled, cried for help. From his temple, he heard my voice. And my cry to him reached his ears. Verse 7. Then the earth reeled and rocked. The foundations also of the mountains trembled and quaked because he was angry. God saved David in his distress. Verse 6. In my distress, I called upon the Lord. God saved David in his distress. And then it ends in verse 7. Because he was angry, the earth reeled and rocked. The foundations of the mountains trembled and quaked. See, God was angry at how his beloved king was being treated. And so what are we to make of all these images that will follow next in verse 7 all the way through verse 19? Okay, what we will see in verse 7 now through 19, there's 50 verses in the psalm, by the way. So, uh, Verse 7 through 19, it describes how David, or God's overwhelming presence is manifested in the world. He's going to talk about earthquakes. He's going to talk about smoke and darkness, wind, hail, fire, lightning. These all give a sense of God's awesome, terrifying presence. We're starting with verse 7 through 11. Then the earth reeled and rocked. The foundations of the mountains trembled and quaked because he was angry. Smoke went out from his nostrils and devouring fire from his mouth. Glowing coals flamed forth from him. He bowed the heavens and came down. Thick darkness was under his feet. He rode on a cherub and flew. He came swiftly to the wings of the winds. He made darkness his covering, his canopy around him, thick clouds dark with water. Now all these images he's referring to here echo actually when God appeared to Israel back on Mount Sinai. Okay? Think of the things that we just mentioned in verse 7 through 11 of the psalm. The earth reeled, the rock, the earth shook, there was smoke from his nostrils, there was glowing coals, uh, he bowed the heavens, there was darkness under his feet, darkness was his covering, the clouds were his water. Now, think about the time in the Exodus when the nation of Israel was at Mount Sinai. Exodus chapter 19, verse 16. On the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings and the thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast so that all the people in the camp trembled. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God and they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now, Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because Yahweh had descended on it in fire. The smoke of it went out up like the smoke of a kiln and the whole mountain trembled greatly. 
And as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him in thunder. And so the images that we see in Psalm uh, 18, verse 7 through 11, very much echo the Exodus when the people of Israel gathered in front of Mount Sinai. Now, verse 12 of Psalm 18, out of the brightness before him, hailstones and coals of fire broke through his clouds. The Lord Yahweh also thundered in the heavens and the Most High uttered his voice, hailstones and coals of fire. And he sent out his arrows and scattered them. He flashed forth lightnings and routed them. In verse 12 through 14 of Psalm 18, it recalls how God helped Israel conquer the land under Joshua. Okay, it's talking about in like in Joshua chapter 10, verse 11. Okay, talking about the hailstones that we just heard here in Psalm 18. This is uh, Joshua 10, verse 11. As, and as they fled before Israel, while they were going down the ascent of Beth Horon, the Lord Yahweh threw down large stones from heaven on them as far as Azekah, and they died. And there were more who died because of the hailstones than the sons of Israel killed with the sword. Hailstones. Again, the image is now hearkening back not only to the Exodus in Mount Sinai, but now to when Joshua was uh, leading the people of Israel and God was helping them conquer the land of Canaan, their promised land, after leaving Egypt. Okay, this was Joshua that we just read. And then finally, verse 15 in Psalm 18. Then the channels of the sea were seen and the foundations of the world were laid bare. At your rebuke, O Lord, at the blast of of your nostrils. Okay, so when in Israel's history were the channels of the sea seen and the foundations of the world laid bare? Okay, he's talking about when God parted the Red Sea with the mighty wind. Exodus chapter 15, verse 8. At the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up, the flood stood up in a heap, and the deeps congealed in the heart of the sea. And so again, he's talking about images from Israel's past when God clearly delivered his people from the time of Moses at Mount Sinai when it thundered and there was smoke and, there was the, and people would tremble at his feet from the time when uh, Joshua it was led into the people uh, uh, into conquer Canaan and hailstones fell upon the enemies and to the time where God parted the Red Sea and the, and the, uh, and the uh, channels of the sea were seen to the foundations. Uh, the, as God uh, gathered the waters on each side. Each of these things recall Israel's history. And so the question is, why, why was David recalling all of these events in Israel's history? And the answer is because he was what the point he was making it here in the psalm is that the same God who rescued Israel in the time of Moses and in the time of Joshua is the same God who works powerfully in David's life as well. Same God. So he's recalling the times of God's deliverance in history to say, that's the same God who lives today. That's the same God who, who's watching over us. The same God who works in my life. Verse 16, David says, in verse 16 through 19, David says, he sent, he sent from on high, he took me. He drew me out of the many waters. He rescued me from the strong enemy and from those who hated me. And for, for they were too mighty for me, and they confronted me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my support. He brought me out into a broad place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. See how he changes to the first person now? He's talking about me, mine. So he's saying the same God that delivered God's people in Israel in the time of Moses and Joshua is the same God who delivers me. Look what all he did for me. He drew me out of many waters. He rescued me from my strong enemy. From those who hated me, he could, they confronted me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my support. He brought me to a wide, uh, unto a broad place. And so he's recalling how God, David is changing down to the first person because he's saying that God rescued David from his enemies who engulfed him like a flood. He says, it's like many waters for my enemies. They, he drew me out of many waters. He's talking about his enemies surrounding him, engulfing him, like he was drowning in enemies, as God brought him, it says in verse 19 of Psalm 18, 
God brought him into a broad place. Okay, so the image is he, he, he's being drowned in a, in, a, in a torrent of mighty waters and he brought him to the shore. The broad place is like the shore. He brought him to a safe shore. And that's what David's saying. God brought me into a broad place. He brought me to the shore in the gulf, in being, while I was being engulfed by many waters. And David's victory also pointed to when God would redeem us through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. See, when Jesus cried out to God on the cross, the earth shook, if you remember, and darkness came over the land, and God raised Jesus from the grave. Okay, the earth shook, darkness came over the land. So he's recalling also, prophetically, the time when Jesus would be delivered from death itself. David was part of God's greater purpose, therefore, to bring salvation through his descendant, Jesus Christ, son of David. And this becomes more clear in verse 20. The Lord Yahweh dealt with me according to my righteousness. According to the cleanness of my hands, he rewarded me. That's verse 20. So David is declaring that God rescued him because of his integrity, the cleanness of my hands, he says. Okay? According to the cleanness of my hands, he rewarded me. Meaning, I didn't, he didn't murder anyone with his hands. Verse 21 and verse 22. For I have kept the ways of Yahweh the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. For all his rules were before me and his statutes I did not put away from me. So David again is, says he's kept God's laws and statutes. Okay? He says, um, where I've kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God, his rules and his statutes I did not put away from me. Okay, God's laws he did not put away from him, he's saying. In verse 23, he says, David says, I was blameless before him and I kept myself from my guilt. Now, we pause there now. David's saying all these things. He's saying... You know, it's because of my integrity. It's because of my righteousness. According to the cleanness of my hands, I have kept the ways of the Lord. I have not wickedly departed from my God. All his rules are before me. I, his statutes I did not put away from me. I was blameless before him. I kept myself from my guilt. And I ask you this question. David calls himself blameless. And David indeed was known to be a man after God's own heart in Scripture. Yet David, of course... If you know him, David was not without sin, right? He says he's blameless, but then he's saying he's not without sin. In 1 Kings, it says exactly that. 1 Kings chapter 15, verse 5 says, David did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, Yahweh, and did not turn aside from anything that he commanded him all the days of his life, except, what does it say? In the matter of Uriah the Hittite. Okay, remember Uriah the Hittite? Probably, maybe some of you don't know who that Uriah the Hittite was. The husband of Bathsheba, whom he murdered after he committed adultery with his wife, Uriah, uh, his wife Bathsheba. So David committed adultery, as we know. It says that in Scripture. We know about that. that Bathsheba, Uriah's wife. Then, when Bathsheba became pregnant, David tried to conceal this sin and have Uriah killed in battle. He arranged to have him murdered. And so I ask you, if David committed adultery and he committed murder, two of the commandments of the Ten Commandments, how could he claim, verse 23, I was blameless before him and kept myself from guilt? How can he say that? How could he say in verse 21, I have kept the ways of the Lord. I have not wickedly departed from my God. Okay, the answer is because David wasn't talking about himself. Clearly, it's not talking about himself. Yeah, he's not blameless. It says that in Scripture, 1 Kings. David actually was prophetically speaking of his descendant, Jesus Christ. Because only he was perfect. Only he was without sin. So David wasn't talking about himself. That's why he's talking about himself being blameless. He's not talking about himself, clearly, obviously. Because, of course, he did sin. Okay? Egregiously. He murdered. He had someone murdered took someone's wife, committed adultery. And so David was speaking prophetically about Jesus Christ, his future descendant, just as David wasn't talking about himself back in Psalm 16, verse 10. 
Okay, we looked at Psalm 16 a couple weeks ago. In Psalm 16, verse 10, it says, For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, the grave, or let your Holy One see corruption. If you remember, we saying but David wasn't talking about himself there either, because he's even though he's saying, You will not abandon my soul to Sheol, and David wrote that, he's not talking about himself there, because David did die, and his body did stay in the grave and rot in the grave. It did see corruption. So obviously he was not talking about himself, he's talking about his descendant, prophetically, Jesus Christ, who did not see corruption, who rose from the grave. And so in the same way, Psalm 16, verse 10, is not talking about David himself, even though he says, my soul. In the same way, he's not talking about himself here in Psalm 18, when he says, I have been blameless. He's talking about his descendant, prophetically, Jesus Christ, in both cases. And that's what we see here. That's it's important to see that he was speaking of Dave, uh, Jesus. Because only Jesus could say, verse 20, only Jesus could say, the Lord dealt with me according to my righteousness. According to the cleanness of my hands, he rewarded me. Only Jesus could say that. Only Jesus could say, I was blameless before him, verse 23, and I kept myself from my guilt. Verse 24, so the Lord Yahweh has rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands in his sight. Only David or Jesus could say that. Because only Jesus without, was without sin. And that's why death could not hold him in the grave. He died for our sins, and for three days he stayed in that grave, but death could not hold him because he was innocent. He had never sinned. He did not die for his own sins. He had no sin. He died for yours and my sin. And so if I'm ever righteous as a person, as a believer in Jesus Christ, if I personally am ever righteous, if I'm ever loving, if I'm ever forgiving, it's only because of Jesus Christ and his Holy Spirit. Because even David wasn't righteous. But if I'm ever righteous, it's only through Jesus Christ and by the Holy Spirit within me, the spirit of truth that we talked about that works powerfully in us when we surrender to his will. And so our, say, our God is a mighty God who works powerfully for our deliverance because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ, our Savior. So day God is a mighty God who works powerfully in us, through us, for us, for our deliverance because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ by his merit, not ours, our Savior. And so our love for God is a response to his love for us in rescuing us from death. And our God is a mighty and powerful God who works for our deliverance because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. He's the one who was without sin, who was blameless. And God rewarded him according to his righteousness. He rewarded him not only by raising him from the grave, but then redeeming us, the people that he died for. What a great gift that he had given us. What a great thing he did for us that loved us so much that he gave himself for us. Now God cannot be fooled or manipulated. Verse 25 of Psalm 18. With the merciful, it says, you show, you show yourself merciful. With the blameless man, you show yourself blameless. With the purified, you show yourself pure. And with the crooked, you make yourself seem torturous. See, God's not fooled. God is not mocked. David tells us that God responds to us in the same way that we have been. Okay? okay if we've been merciful... You show, God shows himself merciful. With the blameless, God shows himself blameless. With the purified, God shows himself pure. And with the crooked, God makes himself seem torturous. He shows himself good to those who have good hearts, yet with the crooked, he marks himself, who makes himself, quote, seem torturous. And what does that mean? Well, let's give you an example. Remember Jacob, the son of Isaac, grandson of Abraham. Jacob, if you remember, was a schemer. Okay, he was not a righteous person. He was a schemer. He tricked his own brother out of his birthright for a bowl of soup. He deceived his own father, right? You remember? He put on his brother's clothes while he, was, he couldn't see anymore, and he asked for his father's blessing in disguise and deceived his own father. Now, what came of Jacob's life because of his trickery, his scheming? Well, remember when David had sons of his own? Deception came back to him, right? 
when his own sons deceived him and saying that his son Joseph had died, right? When actually they sold him into slavery into Egypt. So it came back to him. Okay? He reaped what he sowed. He deceived his brother. He deceived his uh, father. And now deception came back to him and his own sons deceiving him and telling him his son Joseph was dead. Or another example. After David, uh, we talked about David's sin with Bathsheba and had her husband killed what happened later on? David reaped what he sowed. One of his own sons later on, David's own sons, assaulted sexually his half-sister. Okay? And then later that half-sister's brother murdered the brother that assaulted her. Okay, so brother rever- re- re- in revenge murdered a brother. Okay, two of David's sons murdered each other. And one of his daughters was assaulted. All of this came back to David. He reaped what he sowed. Galatians chapter... 6, verse 7, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Who, for whatever one sows, that will he also reap. That will you also reap. And so as it says, to the merciful you will show yourself merciful, to the blameless man you will show yourself blameless, to the purified you show yourself pure. But with the crooked you make yourself seem torturous. The word seem, though, is interesting. It doesn't say that God is torturous, that he is mean. He says he makes himself seem torturous. Whereas we will see that God still had mercy upon Jacob and he still had mercy upon David in the end. Even though they committed these sins. In the end, Jacob did get his son back, Joseph, as you know the story. Even though he, they were deceiving him and they said he was dead, in the end, right, we know the story, he did get to see his son Jacob, uh, Joseph again. Jacob did. And even though David's own son murdered his other brother and they tried to take over his kingdom, David's kingdom survived. So in the end, God did show mercy, but he still reaped what he sowed. So yes, God will is not mocked. You will reap what you sow. What you sow, yeah, that which you also be. It doesn't mean that God is mean, though. It only seems like he's, he's torturous because in the end, he still shows grace. Because he didn't have to establish David's kingdom after all that. He could have said, okay, your kingdom's done. Forever you will never have a kingdom. Nope. David's kingdom was survived. And also Jacob did get his son back, didn't he? And so to the crooked you make yourself seem torturous. Okay, God's not cruel. It seems that way, though, when you're being disciplined by because he's loving, and because he's just. Verse 27. For you save the humble people, but the haughty eyes you bring down. See, that's what it comes down to. He disciplines us. You save a humble people with the haughty eyes you bring down. Verse 27. Verse 28. For it is you who light my lamp. The Yahweh, my God, the Lord, lightens my darkness. Even in the darkness of our own making, even in our own sin like David, like Jacob, ourselves, even in the darkness of our own making, we caused it. God was able to redeem the situation and work out his greater purpose. I mean, lo and behold, Jacob still was the descendant of the 12 tribes of Israel through which came eventually the tribe of Judah, through which became the Savior, Jesus Christ. God still redeemed even though Jacob was a scheming, you know, uh, you know, fool, right? He was a schemer who deceived his own father. And yes, David committed those sins. He was not perfect in any sense. And yet the, the Messiah still was descended from the tribe of Judah from the line of David. God still had mercy. He still works out his greater purpose, even though there is darkness. Verse 28. For it is you who light my lamp. Yahweh, my God, lightens my darkness. See how he calls it my darkness? It's darkness that we did to ourselves. We're the ones that strayed. We're the ones that that sometimes will blow it and mess up our lives. It's my darkness. We do it to ourselves. And yet it doesn't mean that God has lost hope. It doesn't mean that God can't redeem it. Sure, we will, he will discipline those he loves, but it doesn't mean that God cannot redeem the situation, which he did in the case of Jacob, in the case of David, in the case of many. Verse 29. For by you I can run against the troop, and by my God I can leap over a wall. Okay, what he's saying is there is that there is no barrier that God cannot overcome. Whether it's a troop in pursuing you, or whether it's a wall of a city that you can't scale. No, by my God, I can leap over a wall. And by you, I can run against a troop. There's no barrier that God cannot overcome. 
David next tells us how God strengthened him as a warrior in battle. Verse 30 to 32. This God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield for all those who take refuge in him. For who is God but Yahweh, the Lord? And who is a rock except our God? The God who equipped me with strength and made my way blameless. So God, he's, David is talking about like a soldier who was entering an army. God equipped him with strength. Verse 32. And how did God equip David? Verse 33. He made my feet like the feet of a deer and set me secure on the heights. So first of all, it says God gave him the agility to walk on rocky terrain like a deer. That's what deer can do. They can walk on on the heights of the mountains or rocks, or rocky hills, because uh, they're very agile. So he says, gave, God gave me that same agility, like the feet of a deer, verse 33, and set me secure in the heights. Another way that God equips him, verse 34, he trains my hands for war so that my arms can bend a bow of bronze. Okay, most bows were made of wood, obviously, but if you have a bow of bronze, that would take incredible strength to bend that bow. And so what he's saying is that God gave me incredible superhuman strength when I need it. He trains my hands for war so that my arms can bend an incredible bow of bronze. God gave David enormous strength. Another way that God equips him, verse 35, you have given me the shield of your salvation and your right hand supported me and your gentleness made me great. Okay, the shield is a defensive weapon. Okay, not only he gave him offensive weapons, and abilities, but he says, give me a shield. And the shield is his salvation. Verse 36, he equipped him also by saying, you gave a wide place for my steps under me, and my feet did not slip. Basically saying God cleared a path for him. There may have been rocks, there may have been barriers, there have been obstructions in his path, but God clears our path. If God is with you, he will clear a path for you. It doesn't mean that there won't be obstacles in your way when you follow God. It means that though those obstacles exist, he will clear a path for you. Okay, there's a difference between that things will always go easy for you when you follow Christ. And there's a difference between saying, no, there will be obstacles, but God will clear them in his time. All right, so he says, you gave a wide place for my steps before me, and my feet did not slip. Now, this also points to all these things of how God equips David. This also points to how Jesus also fought spiritual battles of his own. The spiritual battles he fought were against Satan himself. Luke chapter 8, verse 27. When Jesus had stepped out of the, on the land, out on land, there he met him, there met him a man from the city who had demons. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him and said with a loud voice, what have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, do not torment me. What did the demon do when they saw Jesus? It was legion. The many, he had many demons. It says they fell down before Jesus. He cried out and fell down before him. Okay. You made, verse 36, you gave a wide place for my steps under me and my feet did not slip. He's saying that God is clearing the way not only for David, not only for us, but also for Jesus himself. The demons fall at his feet. They're no longer a barrier to him. They're begging him, do not torment me. Jesus' enemies could not refute his teachings. Satan even tempted him, but could not lead him to sin in the desert. And Jesus conquered Satan by his death. And so as believers in Jesus Christ, that we also, too, have spiritual weapons and armor for the spiritual battle that is before us. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12 through 17, Paul writes, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. We do not wrestle against man. Okay, sometimes we forget that. Sometimes we, just, we, we think that our battle is against the other people who are against Christians or the people that are hurting us or the people that create laws against us. Of course they do. They're not followers of Christ. But our battle is not against flesh and blood. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. 
Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand in the evil day, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. The gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation with the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. See, our battle is not against other human beings. It's not against flesh and blood. Our battle is spiritual. And sometimes we forget that. Sometimes even believers forget that our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual forces of evil. When you think about it, even if you defeat every human opponent there is, even if everything that you vote for goes your way, every, everybody that you elect is, is, that you, is, you want is, is in office, everything goes your way, you defeat every opponent, let's say every person that is against you or against Christians or persecuting you, they're all conquered. But you know what? Even if that were all to happen, if you were to defeat every human opponent, you haven't won anything. Because the spiritual forces of evil are still there, aren't they? You can conquer every human opponent you have and have them all go God's way and you still win nothing because the spiritual forces of evil are still there. You have to fight your battle against the actual enemy, the spiritual forces of evil. Because if you win against humans, you haven't won anything. You haven't done anything. You haven't touched the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly realms. And those take spiritual armor that he calls about. And so our battle is not against flesh and blood. Our battle is against, as he says, the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly realms. Now what are those things that we can do against these spiritual forces then? Against these spiritual forces of evil, Satan and his demons... What can we do? He says in Ephesians, and he talks about it, he alludes to it here in the Psalm 18. The first thing we have is we wield God's truth. The belt of truth. Okay, We wield God's truth. That's the most important. That's one of the most important things we do. The second thing we do against the spiritual forces of wickedness is we have his righteousness through Jesus Christ. That's the breastplate. The third thing we have is we have the good news of Jesus Christ. Salvation. The shoes of the gospel of peace. We also have our faith in Christ, which is a shield. A shield to us. And then David describes the victories that he's had through God in verse 37. I pursued my enemies and overtook them and did not turn back till they were consumed. I thrust them through so that they were not able to rise and they fell under my feet. For you equipped me with strength for the battle, and you made those who rise against me sink under me. You made my enemies turn their backs to me, and those who hated me I destroyed. Those are the victories that David had over his enemies. Jesus defeated the enemy of death and Satan on the cross. We also have spiritual armor to fight the spiritual battle against our ultimate enemy as well. Verse 41, they cried for help, but there was none to save. They cried to Yahweh, but they did not answer them. He did not answer them. I beat them fine as dust before the wind. I cast them out like mire in the, of the streets. You delivered me from strife with the people, and you made me the head of the nations, and people whom I have not known served me. And so he's talking about the people here. In verse 43, Okay, um, you delivered me from the strife with the people. What he's talking about that in that, that verse, the people, he's talking about fellow Israelites, not, not foreign nations. The people are the fellow Israelites, David's own people, God's own people, who fought against David. And as we know in David's life, yes, people betrayed David among his own people. Okay, they tried to put a coup against him. Twice. But ultimately... David's victories point to the victories of Jesus Christ. David's descendant. Jesus also had conflict with his fellow Israelites, right? The Jews hated Jesus. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, okay, they hated Jesus. Jesus also had conflict with his own people. They rejected him. And they also delivered him to death. 
But now, Jesus is the head of nations. He is the head of nations. As it says in verse 43, you made me the head of nations. Verse 44, as soon as they heard of me, they obeyed me. Foreigners, now he's talking about people of other nations. Foreigners came cringing to me. Foreigners lost heart and came trembling out of their fortresses. Foreigners mean obviously non-Jews who also received Jesus as Savior. They come but cringing to Jesus. They come on their hands and knees. Okay? Foreigners lost heart and trembling out of their fortresses. Jesus defeated the greatest enemies of all. Not only is the foreigners, the Gentiles, but Jesus, as the head of nations, defeated the greatest enemies of all, death and the devil. His victory is, over, is our victory. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 24. He delivers the kingdom to God, the Father, after destroying every rule and every authority and power. He must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. See, Jesus destroyed death and the devil. That's what he did. That's what scripture says. He destroyed death. Death has no hold on us now through Jesus Christ. He destroyed the greatest enemies of all, death and the devil. And then David ends the psalm, verse 46. The Lord Yahweh lives, and blessed be my rock, and exalted be the God of my salvation. Okay, we know that psalm, right? right? The Lord lives, blessed be my rock, and exalted be the God of my salvation. Some of us may know that uh, worship song. He's saying that God is alive. God is alive. The Lord liveth. The Lord lives. And he is a rock. And he is to be exalted. David's love for God, again, is a response to how God rescued him. Verse 47. The God who gave me vengeance and subdued peoples under me, who rescued me from my enemies, yes, you exalted me above those who rose against me. You delivered me from the man of violence. David's response, then, is what our response to God is to be. David's response is what our response is to be. Verse 49. For this I will praise you, O Yahweh, among the nations, and sing to your name. For this I will praise you, all the things you've done for me, O Yahweh, among the nations, and sing to your name. Great salvation he brings to his king and shows steadfast love to his anointed, to David and his offspring forever. David is saying, I will praise you for this, I will praise you for your great salvation. And that's why we worship God every week. That's why we come to what we call a worship service. It's not a sermon service. It's a worship service. We give glory to God because worship is part of the battle. Worship is actually a weapon. Worship, when God, when the devil hears that, they flee, and when God hears it, he is magnified. Worship is our weapon. And so, what do you think we'll be doing when we go to heaven? Okay, what do you think we'll be doing when we, for a lot of our time? We'll be worshiping. And so, let's worship in preparation for what we will be doing for an eternity. That's what worship is. It's not just a filler, you know, like the 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 um, trailers before the movie. You know, you come in, you eat your popcorn, you. Just, you talk to your friends. And then when the movie starts, you're all quiet because it's just a trailer. That's not what worship is at all. It's not the trailer. It's not the credits at the end. Worship is the battle. You give praise to glory to God. For this I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations and sing to your name. Great salvation he brings to his king and shows steadfast love to his anointed, to David and his offspring forever. God deals with us according to our hearts. To bring about his redeeming purpose. Even when we mess up our lives, which we often do, I do. He can still redeem it. But yes, he will reap what you sow at times. He equips us for battle. And in him, we have victory. Through Christ alone, we have our victory.
victory. For our love for God is a response to how he rescues us. And God powerfully works for our deliverance because of Jesus' righteousness. And God deals with you according to our hearts and equips you and equips us for every battle we face. At this time, we want to commemorate the great battle that Jesus won, the victory he won on the cross through a time of what we call communion. And so would the ushers come forward, Calvin and Wayne, come forward, help me pass out these elements that you guys... Okay, this is the body of Christ, which was broken for you. Okay, whenever you eat of this body, remember me, Jesus says, for which the, the blood I shed for you, the, for which I died. Let's take it together. This cup is the covenant of my blood, Jesus said. Okay. Whenever you drink of this cup, remember me. This is my blood, which was shed for you. So when you drink of this cup, and eat of this bread, you will proclaim my death, Jesus said, until I return again. And that's what we look forward to, the great victory we have in Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your blessing of this great victory you've won in Christ. It starts again with the cross. It starts and ends with the cross. The victory is already won, in fact. We already know who wins. We don't have to worry about Satan. We don't have to worry about death. We don't have to worry about anything because the victory is already won, Father. But here while we are on earth, sometimes I falter. Sometimes we falter because we lose sight of the victory we have in you, the power that we have in you through your Holy Spirit. Help us, Father, to surrender to your will. Help us to fight our battle, not against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual forces of evil that come against us with your truth, with your gospel, with your righteousness, with your shield of faith, with the word of God, the sword of the Spirit. Father, we fight these battles against Satan and the demons that torture our minds, that, that trick us, that cause us to follow other things, that fall into worldly things, Father. Because they only want to do is keep us from you, from trusting you, from um, trusting in your love and trusting in your salvation. But Father, we have that shield and we hold it up uh, in this battle. Thank you, Father, for winning this battle already for us. We have victory in Jesus, Father. Thank you, Jesus, for loving us so much. We worship you now. We worship you now, for you are worthy. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.